Welcome back to my second video about Git, and this one is on the common usage of Git. Common in this case is going to mean common across all workflows. Because Git is well suited for solo development and team development, it makes sense to look at the things that are the same for both. And then usage in this case is going to mean the actual commands that you use all the time across both workflows. Because two future videos are going to look specifically at solo workflow and team workflow, we're not going to look too much at Git workflow in this video, and we're going to focus more on just the common commands and how they work. So let's begin. On the screen, you can see which commands we're going to be looking at, and I group them in a way to where they're with other commands that are kind of related to one another. But don't worry, we will cover each one individually. So first thing I'll look at is git clone, and in the first video, we looked at git clone a little bit. We ran git clone, and then we supplied a URL and then we let that basically download the repository to our computer. Because the first video only looked at using git clone as a way to acquire software and not as a way to get a repository that you might want to work on, it makes sense to cover that use case specifically. So two things happens when you git clone. It downloads the repo and it sets up your origins. And we can inspect what the origins are by using the next command in our list, git remote. So if we do git remote dash v, it'll tell us what our origins are. And it shows that they're both the same, one for fetch and one for push. Your origin is going to be whatever URL was supplied to git clone. And this is most likely going to be the master copy of your repository, which is usually going to be hosted somewhere, maybe on GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket. Now, if you make a new repo from scratch, such as with git init, you'll need to add your own origin. And you can do that with git remote add origin. We'll go into more detail on this when we talk about workflows in future videos. The next command is git status, and this command is pretty simple. When we run it, it tells us about two important things. First, it tells us what branch we're on. In this case, I'm on the master branch. And the second thing it tells me about is which files in my repository have changed and which files are ready to be committed. If you see the message, nothing to commit, working tree clean, this means that there's been no changes to your repository locally. So now I just want to show you what it looks like in the other cases. So in my repository, I have a file called hello.txt. If I were to open up that file and add a word like world and then save it and then do git status again, you can see I see something different. So what git is telling us right now is it sees that a change has been made to hello.txt. However, it's a change that's not staged for commit. So it makes sense to take a second and talk about some of this terminology. You can think of a commit as a collection of changes that have been finalized and are ready to be published to the master copy of the repository. So because a commit represents finalized changes to a group of files that are ready to be published, there is going to be a time where you may have a bunch of files, but not all of them are finalized. So this is where the whole idea behind staged comes in. The whole idea behind staging is so you can simultaneously have a group of files that you're working on and a group of files that you have decided are finalized and ready for commit. So that brings us to our next two commands, add and commit. So right now we have one file change, but nothing is staged for commit. So if we were to try to commit it using git commit dash M, say changes, you can see it says changes not staged for commit and it shows the one file and that says no changes added to commit. And this is because we haven't told git which files are actually finalized and ready for commit. So if you wanna stage some changes for commit, you can do git add and then you specify the file. So we'll supply hello.txt. Now if we do git status, we see something a little different. Now we see changes to be committed and it shows our one file. I guess this will be a little bonus command, git reset, but if you wanted to just undo what you just did and just unstage a particular file, you would do git reset head and then specify the file, so hello.txt. Now in effect what this did is it just made it so we never added it. So if we run git status now, we see we're just back to step one. So I really added the file. Now it's important to note that when you do git add in a file, what you're doing is you're actually staging the changes to that file and not the file itself. To better illustrate this point, since hello.txt has been added and it's ready to be committed, if I now made a change again to hello.txt, we'll add like hello world and then save it and then do git status, you can see we have something completely new. We now have changes not staged for commit, hello.txt, and then we have changes to be committed, hello.txt. So basically the change that's ready to be committed is just the word world that was added, but the new change I've made is the words hello world added. But no big deal, if you want to restage that file, you do it the same way, git add hello.txt, and we do git status, it looks the same as it used to be. So we have a change that we deem finalized and we're ready to publish it, so now it's time to commit it. So to commit it, you do git commit, you do dash m, and then in quotes, you specify the commit message that you want to use. So in this case, I'll do updated hello.txt. Once you have that ready, hit enter, and the commit's been done. 
So now you're kind of back to square one. If you do get status, you can see you get the message, nothing to commit, working tree clean. And this is the loop that you'll do over and over. You'll make changes, you'll add them, you'll commit them. You'll make changes, you'll add them, you'll commit them. What's cool about commits is they actually act like bookmarks in time, which is to say that you can go back to any commit you've ever made and see what your repository looked at at that exact moment. And if you think about it, that's an extraordinarily powerful feature because what it ultimately means is you will never lose work. Because say you made a bunch of files and you committed them and then you deleted all those files and you committed them again, obviously those files are gone, but you could just go back in time to that previous commit and retrieve all those files. So what do you do with all these commits? Well, if you are just using Git locally and you don't have any remote master copy of the repository, then you don't really do anything with them. They just access the history. But if you did have a repository on GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket or something like that, then you could now do git push. So what I did now is I made a new repo on GitHub and I set it as my origin. You can see now git status reports that my branch is ahead of the origin branch by one commit. And what this means is I have one change locally that the remote repo does not have. So if I want to give my change to the remote repo, I do git push and it sends it up. And if I go now in GitHub, you can see I had an empty repository, but when I refresh it, I now have that file that I made. Now we'll go into more detail on that when we talk about the solo and the team workflows. So you can publish changes with, with git push, but then you can get changes from the remote repository with git pull and git fetch. Now because we're going to start talking about branches, it's worth talking a little bit about what that is. Right now our repo has one branch called master, which is also the default branch that you get when you make a new repo. You can think of a branch a lot like a workspace where you can work in them and make changes. However, you can also have multiple branches, which gives you separate workspaces to make other changes. In larger projects, this is really useful because you can work on two separate changes in two different places without the two conflicting with one another. And we'll go into branches in more detail when we talk about workflows. However, for this video, git push, pull, and fetch all operate on the same branch you're on. So when I do git push, I'm pushing from my master branch to the remote master branch. When I do git pull, I'm pulling from the remote master branch down to my local master branch. For the purpose of this video, with git push, pull, and fetch, just know that they all operate on the current branch you're on, and they interact with the remote branch of the same name. So in our case, because we just have one branch called master, git push, pull, and fetch all operate on the master branch. So git pull and git fetch have slight differences. Git fetch basically takes all of the changes from your remote branch and brings them down to an origin branch in your repository. If we come over to our repo here, we do git branch, which is a new command. We can see it shows us the current local branches that we have, and then the asterisk denotes which branch we're currently on. However, if we do git branch dash a, it shows us both our local branches and our remote branches. And this is because our local repository is made up of two parts. It's made up of the repository itself and then what we call a working tree. And the working tree is nothing more than the actual files in your repository. So when I do git fetch, what it does is it looks at the master branch on my repo repository and it updates origin slash master on my local repository. Now what git pull is, is it's git fetch followed by git merge. So when I go ahead and do git pull, it does a git fetch, and then it does a fast forward, which is a type of merge. Now if that was a little complicated, don't worry, the effect is much simpler, and the effect is the changes from the remote repository are now in my local repository, and that's it. So now if I were to look in the files in my repo, you can see I have readme.md, which was the file that I added on GitHub, so I could have something to pull down to my local repo. For the most part, you're always going to just do git push and git pull, but there are some use cases where you want to use git fetch. We'll chat more about that in the solo and the team workflows. So let's talk a little bit about git branch and git checkout, just in how they're used. Git branch, of course, shows you just your local branches. If you wanted to make a new branch, which makes a new workspace, you could do git branch and then supply the name. So like my feature. Now when I do git branch, you can see I have two. I have master and my feature, and the asterisk denotes the branch that I'm currently on. If I want to change to the my feature branch, I simply do git checkout, my feature. Now when I do git branch, you can see that the asterisk has moved to my feature. So now I'll go back to the master branch with git checkout, and then if I want to delete a branch, I can do git branch dash D, specify the name, and it gets rid of my branch. Now when I do git branch, you can see I just have the master branch again. And in the workflows video, we're going to talk in depth about how to use branches in terms of workflows. So you'll learn a lot more about that in those.
Git merge is going to be a command that we use to merge two branches together, which is to say we take one branch, we take a second branch, and we integrate the changes from the second branch into the first branch. We'll be talking a lot more about how to use branches, and when we do that, git merge is going to seem a lot more useful. On a single branch of master, git merge really has no use. Next is going to be git log, and the whole purpose of this command is just to see a list of everything that's happened within a repository. So if we go back to our repository and we run git log, we can see a bunch of information here. And this is ordered from newest to oldest. So the very top entry is going to be the new file that I added directly on GitHub. That's why it has a different name and email. And these other two files are the ones we made during this video. Git log shows some important information other than author and date in the commit message. It also has this long string of characters, and this is called the commit hash. Now what this represents is a unique identifier of this point in time in the repo. So this hash can be used for two commands. The first one is git checkout, where you can supply the hash, and this will take you back to that point in time in the repository and make your working tree look like what it looked like at that time. You can also use it with git diff if you want to know all the changes since that hash. So if I want to say, show me all the changes that were made in change file and create readme, I could take this commit hash, do git diff, specify the hash, hit enter, and then I can see these changes. Now this shows us a collection of all changes and not any specific commit. And the last thing with git log is when you do git log, you get a long form output. If you just wanted something that's smaller, just like commit hash and, and the text, you could do git log dash dash one line to get a smaller one. Now you probably noticed that there's only a partial hash here. There's only seven characters. And this is because git is smart enough to take a partial hash and apply it to the full hash as long as there's no duplicates. So because 210cd1e is sufficiently random and there's not going to be any collisions on that, you can do git diff 210cd1e and it'll treat it as if you supplied this entire hash. And last but not least is git diff. Now we partially talked about this as it pertains to commit hashes, but you can also use it to see changes while you're working on a particular set of changes that you're about to commit. So for this, I'm gonna go back to my repo and I'm going to edit my hello.txt file again. I'll do hello world and I'll add a few more exclamation marks. Now when I do git status, it shows me that there's changes not staged for commit. And here's where git diff is really useful. I can simply run git diff and it'll tell me what's been changed. Now because git operates on the lines and not specific characters, what this is saying is this line was deleted and this line was added. Now git diff by default shows all changes for all files, but you could just do git diff in a specific file if you just wanted the changes in that file. Now, very important, git diff by default only operates on changes not staged for commit. So if I were to add hello.txt and stage it for commit, you could see now when I do git diff, nothing happens. If I wanna see the changes for the staged files, I do git diff dash dash cached. And then the diff or difference is going to be the difference in the files from the last time there was a commit. And that's it for the common usage of the git commands. We are gonna go into more detail on this in both the solo workflow and Teams workflow video. And a lot of this is going to come together and make a lot more sense. Because it's one thing to learn what they do and it's another to apply it to an actual problem. And a lot of these are really workflow dependent such as git push, pull and fetch, branch and checkout and merge are really based on workflows. If you have any questions, let me know below in the comments and thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.